Um, we're going to call the September 4th meeting to order. And uh, for the first order of business is public comment. So you have a couple of folks in the room. Would either of you like to use public comment tech? I just um, got a copy of the MRPS staff climate survey, and I'm a little concerned with since I have my grandchildren are. Well, one of them is in U UES and one in MAS, M whatever it is, MMS. Um, the numbers for UES are pretty are pretty bad. And I just wonder if you're going to address those in in open session. Um, you know, we were told when you voted to take our kids that they were coming to a place that was much better them and these numbers prove that to be actually false um you know when you get percentages in the 20s in the single digits you got real problems and a lot of those are in, it seem to be in leadership so i just wonder whether or not those are numbers are ever going to be addressed in an open forum no answer uh, well, it is our not our practice to engage in public. Comment. Right. Okay. Well, let me to... let me ask the superintendent then. Do you have any? Will that be on the agenda at any point in the future? I guess we can answer a technical question like an agenda question of an agenda item. So, any kind of supervision evaluation of any employee would not go for the board in front of a public in a public forum that would if the board were to take that up it would be an executive session because you're discussing employees and the this it's not the board's responsibility i guess i would just add that there's no names involved here i mean i'm just talking about the overall picture of uess that we were given turns out to be a fiction so i'll just leave it at that you're obviously, I mean, I, mean, I Thank know, you for I know your, your opinion. I know your protocol. Thank you for you know? sharing your opinion. Mr. Yeah, Frazier. well, I would just, it's not just my opinion. It's, you know, it's obviously the opinion of whoever wrote this report. Thank you. Do we have anyone online who would like to participate in public comment? I do not see any hands raised. Okay. Next order of business is the consent agenda. Is there a motion? <laughs> to approve the consent agenda? I move that we um, accept the past like the con consent agenda. That was hard to get out of my mouth. Sorry. Thanks, Scott. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thanks, Jake. Any discussion? So the climate survey <clears throat> helps get a sense of just to sort of summarize from my own mind. It is a way to help get a sense of how staff are feeling. What is the timeline that the climate survey goes up for? Is it May, June kind of somewhere in, the, in there? Yep. Toward the end of the school year mm -hmm. to assess the previous school year. And then it's it helps the board in board retreats sort of set priorities and goals, and it helps the superintendent evaluation committee talk about that process and setting goals there as well. Mm -hmm. And so it also helps, as I understand it, the superintendent get information about 
room room for growth areas for improvement, mm -hmm. et cetera. Okay. And it's never really, it's always, it's always been summarized in the, in the warning or in the warrants. I think this is the first been... year we've added it into the consent agenda. So it wasn't in there. Mm -mm. But it's, it's been shared in previous years. Just With not through a the little consent. bit more discussion generally mm, not, or not in board not no. shared at all not in board meetings no and just to, everything you said was correct as far as how it's used and the one thing i would add to that is that the libby and the leadership team also take in all of the data to set their own you know work plans for the year in addition to us using it in the overall evaluation of the district and how we're doing and i also i don't think that it existed prior to Libby. There was no superintendent evaluation committee prior to Libby starting. Well, that's, I that's correct. I, I yeah. don't know if those are related or not. This has been a component in the contract, the negotiated agreement with the MREA. It's not just given to MREA, MREA is our teachers. It's not just given to MREA, it's given to full staff. Right. Um, but it is a contractual obligation of the board to do a survey of that type each year. So has it was it prior to the superintendent? Did it was it in existence prior to the superintendent evaluation committee, or was it, or has that been part of the the contracts? Was it par part of that contract prior to you being the superintendent, or did it only kind of come into existence after you became the superintendent? No, I was there when I got. Here. It was there before. Yeah, I don't. It wasn't this. The survey has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know how my. I can't speak to how much regularity it was done prior to my time. I don't, I've never seen those results. Right. It. And does the equity committee have a little bit to do with trying to work with the questions and make the questions more effective questions or get at the right, get at the information that, that, that we think will be most helpful. The equity committee helped get, uh, helped, do a revision a couple of years ago. And then just this past year, the equity committee handed it off to the evaluation committee saying that it made more sense to live in the broader evaluation universe yeah. of what the board does than the equity universe. Right. Yeah. And so it gives a sense of how communication is working. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily say anything about a student's experience. Students are, are students part of it? Students yeah. don't answer this one. Students yeah. don't answer the mm -hmm. questions. That's right. Only by, I think there's some sort of how teachers and staff believe students might feel about. There are some questions that are of that nature. Yeah. So it only be as reflected through the prism of. And then because of, uh, because we have Panorama, which is a piece of software that helps us gather data and and analyze data that that is a tool that helps us gather information to try to address where there's room for growth mm -hmm. this where, past what year we was find. the first year that we were able to use the panorama software for, for, this. for this and we also use the panorama software when we do when we do do student surveys which this one about is not so but about that, belonging right and there's a possibility that they can some of that are there are there surveys that go to parents that would we, be tracked in Panorama too? Yep, we okay. did the caregiver survey through Panorama. So they can at the end of last so year as well. At, over the next few years, there can be sort of overlapping in that data, so that in some ways, so that things can be. I don't. Know, I mean, that would be nice. So it would be you're nice. Just, you're asking different questions in yeah. the group, so I'm not. I'm not positive if you can compare the results with each other, but perhaps for wide generalizing themes, Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I know that it's easy to look at any piece of data and say it tells a huge story about whatever I want to see. Um, and we're always trying to figure out how to get data that has a lot of different perspectives that mm -hmm. may not always be in agreement. Um, what else can we do? That's what we do. We try. Red, to your point, I think one of the things, oh. or, 
Go ahead, Tim. I was just letting me interrupt. Uh, so Tim, Scott, and then Lynn. Let me interrupt you. I was just letting you know. One of the things that I think we flagged in the summary that I think is important going forward is um, I think given the different tools, we've used different rating scales, which makes it difficult to track um, trends over the years. And so I think as we go forward, it's just, it's my belief. I think we should try and stick with this scale. So, and stick with the general, like we can massage questions if there's other things that come up and we want to focus on other areas, but the more we can stick with the scale so we can track things, I think that would help rather than seeing whatever we want in the data, kind of just give a little bit more of, you know, how are things trending, which I think is what these things are a little bit more useful for than sort of specific action items. So Scott and then Lynn. Yeah, thanks. And and Tim, you you may have just answered my question, um, but I was curious. Um, but the history of the, the questions used in this year's survey and and how many years prior have these specific questions worded in the way they were used? And and I think I heard Tim saying that um, that this that that each year they have changed slightly. Which again, to reiterate his point makes it, um, yeah, you can't make year over year comparisons. And so I do like that idea, Tim, of, of sticking with questions so that we have that, that ability to look at trends. Cause I, I agree that the, that this tool is more about looking at, at how things are going, um, and not at any one particular, um, uh, item, but rather, rather those trends. So yeah, I guess a second vote for what Tim was just saying. Thanks, Scott. Lynn? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, and I'm assuming that um, as we look at the, the survey data, it will um, initiate a plan for the next year, like an improvement plan or something and we'll continue to use that each year to um, look at some goals for Libby maybe or something. Am I correct about that? Yeah, when we take themes from that and as well as the other aspects of the evaluation of Libby where we've had the board fill out the evaluation and individual members of Libby's team, we come we bring in themes from the climate survey as well. Yeah, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Okay. Okay, great. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thanks everybody. And just as a reminder, that consent agenda is generally just kind of pro forma things like minutes from other meetings. And um, in this case, the climate survey, um, the warrants, payroll, things like that, that the board needs to approve as part of our business. And as we did today, any board member can pull an item off the consent agenda for a discussion. Um, did you get my email about adding us the agenda item of the board calendar? before we go into the presentation? The year at a glance? Yeah. It's at the bottom of the agenda. Yeah, I was just thinking it would be helpful to walk through and share with the board what we where we've added in the, some of the priority topics that came out of the retreat. Yeah, you would need to add that here in public. Oh, okay, can we add that right yes. now? <laughs> yeah, we, just, we wouldn't add it to the agenda. You'd add right. it. You okay. Add here in public. So you want to add an agenda item? I'd like to add an agenda item. I think it'll be brief where we take a look together as a board at the draft uh, calendar for the year. Um, would you mind pulling it up on the um, the screen? Just because back at the retreat, we discussed different topics that we wanted to make sure to get to this year. And uh, Jim, Libby, and I um, were able to figure out where some of those fit into the year. Not all of them, but um, we wanted to give everybody an update. So hold on. I can't share my screen right now. Oh, <laughs> is he safe at least? Jim? Yes. He's on his way. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, she's asking Anna for permission to share her screen so she can share the um, 
uh, uh, the calendar. Um, as we're pulling that up, I'll just say as a refresher, the top when we um, uh, at the board retreat, the main like the sort of like top vote getters for topics for us to cover were um, exploring the merger with Washington Central Supervisory Union, the community engagement and communication priority that the board had uh, set last summer, um, basically finalizing that into indicators of success. Um, our facilities in general, particularly um, the fact that our high school is in a floodplain. Um, equity generally as a topic was in the in the top vote getters and um, uh, Roxbury Village School, two themes emerged from that. The, our, our youngest students from Roxbury attending Union. So that transition and how that's going. And the other is the um, the future of the building itself. And then the the last top vote getter was um, a focus on academics. Um, so we have, you have a question? Yeah, was there, where was the, I know that there's a lot of work being done at the legislative level and wasn't there, was there an advocacy element? Was that further down? That? Or did that live further, would that live somewhere around? Didn't get into the topic that came up at the at the retreat as far as things we wanted to tackle. I remember us talking about it before the retreat, um, so it might be something we want to bring back. Yeah. Um, so I'll go through the ones that we have been able to land um, as far as getting them into the calendar. The first is the process that we're going through right now to determine the future of Roxbury Village School, which we are. Um, going to spend the bulk of our time on tonight and then um, use the next few meetings to have more discussion and question asking and um, a community forum, uh, as well as spend some more time gathering public comment around it before we make a decision. Our hope is to be able to make a decision in time for the um, first draft of the budget for next year, which is in early November. So that one has, we've gotten early that one December. early December. Thank you. That one we've gotten into the calendar. Um, the topic of exploring a merger with Wash Central we, does not yet have any, is not reflected in any board meetings on the calendar because we don't have any work to do just yet. Um, Jim and Libby are going to reach back out to their counterparts, um, the superintendent at Wash Central, Stephen, and the um, uh, board chair at Wash Central, Floor Diaz, to um, check in with them and see where things are at and if there's, seems like timing would work for us to take the first step together. Um, the community engagement and, oh, yeah. So what exactly is the timing on that? I think I had in my head that that was happening this summer, that, that reach out to Washington Central. Did. They had a conversation just before that, like on the last day of school, but then there wasn't anything since then, right? No, because Washington Central is in the middle of a pretty big vote around what to do with their buildings right now. So they wanted to do that. That's, is that coming up mm -hmm. like at the board level or is that like town meeting? No, that's at the board, their board. They're, they're, I think they're doing a separate town vote from okay. town meeting this fall. I'm having breakfast actually with Stephen Delajupin Paint on uh, Friday. So okay. I'll find out more information. Then. Okay. Just curious, because folks have been asking, well, that's an area that people are curious about. Right. And we're just sort of asking about timing tonight. I was right. We don't have anything just yet. Okay. But we, we, need, we need a dance partner. Yeah. We basically keep checking back in with them to say, tell us if now's good or now ish is good. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. Um, the refinement of, um, the community engagement and communication goal. Um, the As you might remember, the equity committee is holding, doing that initial work. And is it mid-November? I'm sorry, I was catching Jim up where we are. Ask me, tell me again what you're doing, sorry. <laughs> the um, community engagement and communication goal, I think that was in mid-November, right? For budget? No, um, remember we're to refine yeah. and finalize that. that. Is, uh, yeah, second November. This, meeting, we have discussion of community engagement and communication priority. Yep. 
So that we fit into the calendar there, hoping to that that is the date that we will land that, um, but maybe there will be more work to be done after that. Um, facilities, we have a facilities state of the state coming up next meeting. Yep, yep in our next meeting. And um, we have, and when it comes to equity at the administrative level, we have a, a report on the equity plan that the administration administrative team putting together the first the November first meeting. week first board meeting in November all of this is you can see on the um so I'm running through it pretty quickly just as an overview um and then as far as the focus on academics we have our three um data presentations um this coming year one in the fall one in the winter and one in the spring and then lastly the um one thing that the board really wants to make sure to kind of Make, be keeping track of and taking care with is the transition of our youngest Roxbury students at UES. And we um, asked, Jim and I asked Libby to put extra kind of information in her um, superintendent's report about at, at the start of the year about how, like what we're doing and any kind of sense of how it's going. And then also of course, a request for feedback and, and um, perspectives and, information from everybody who's um, going through that transition. So that's where that lives right now. And just as with anything that's in the consent agenda, any board member can pull that out for discussion. And of course, if you if we wanted to have something more robust in the calendar, uh, we can try and fit it in. So we just wanted to let you know, y'all know where that stuff is at as far as the topics we discussed at the retreat. And Again, just because it's not yet in the calendar doesn't mean we can't find time for it. So if there is something that you were wanting the board to get to that you don't see reflected in the calendar, please let us know and we will try and figure out how to make it happen. If it's something that we're able to spend time on given the priorities that we have for the year. Any questions or thoughts before we move on to the presentation? We can't see. Oh yeah, there's Lynn. Is that an old hand, or you raised your hand again for the calendar? Okay, <laughs> thank you. One thing that might be <clears throat> not that might be um, helpful on the calendar is potentially another row that has like legislative dates. We do have legislative updates on there. It's just not oh. filled in right now. <laughs> But, the, uh, so the, there will be links to the legislative updates that are part of the superintendent's report or, or, or are you asking what would live in that row really how i use that it, row no row? okay so <laughs> yes just to remind you it's a reminder it, okay, of what i want to put in my got superintendent it. reports yeah i mean you you might i don't know like i don't know the first day of when the legislature oh. starts the session in January, yeah, yeah. Th those those little things maybe I don't yeah. know crossovers that kind of stuff that stuff yeah yeah just because we look good in there good for all my political wisdom <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea Rhett thank you Scott sort of in line with what Rhett was just asking about I do think it would be worthwhile for us as a board to think about what sort of legislative advocacy our district is like a strategy for each session um, so that different members of the school community who are going before the legislature understand what the board and the district um, believe are priorities for the legislative session. So are you asking for that to be a um... I, like an item for board discussion at a future meeting? I think that's what I heard Rhett uh, um, getting at is at least, you know, maybe at the beginning or just prior to the beginning. Well, I guess not just prior because that's um, holiday break, but at the beginning of the legislative session, it wouldn't be a bad idea for us to 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 talk about like what we all agree are priorities um, as, as a board. Yeah, and we usually meet with the with our delegation early on too because i don't know if you could talk to that is scheduled that tentatively for the 8th of january oh okay 
which seems like a related but maybe different thing that yeah. Scott yeah. is suggesting. Well, uh, that might be a good. I mean, because we're not going to know what, comes what what's coming down the pike until we, you know, they, that's when we might learn. We might use that to say, you know, tell, tell us what we tell should us tell us what we should be looking out for. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> But, but I'm sort of picking up this and, and from our board priorities conversation from a few weeks ago, it seems like there there are some people on the board who are kind of interested in um, shaping or talking about what people from our district who are testifying or appearing might, you know, are talking about. Is that accurate? I think so. I think it makes sense for us to kind of set priorities. I think the council, city council does that. It's pretty common to set like high level priorities about these are the things that we want to show up on. And these are the things that we we don't as a district. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a useful exercise just to kind of make sure we're generally on the same page. I mean, it is a platform whatever we decide to champion or advocate for it's a stronger platform than I have at my house. Yeah. All right, we will figure out how to, if we can work that in to the calendar. Any other thoughts or questions about the calendar for the year? Remind me what's the if we decide we want to request something, it's just you and Jim shoot. Like, yeah, if you send us an just, email and then we we work it out how, yeah, okay. if if and, and where it yeah. fits in, and um, we'll of course Heads up. bring it up. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, with that, I'm happy to hand running the meeting over to you, Jim. Okay, uh, thank you for getting started. I have to admit, I, I forgot it was Wednesday. Um, so it looks like we're going to the Roxbury Village presentation and just kind of to tee this up a little, um, per the merger agreement, we have to consider uh, potential educational uses for the district for the school and whether we feel there are viable ones. And if we do not, um, the merger agreement uh, has us uh, as a next step offer uh, the building to the town of Roxbury for sale for a dollar. There's some other provisions in there that we need to get some guidance on from our attorney. Um, and we're going to talk with our attorney next week just to see how such a transfer would look. But right now uh, we asked Libby to kind of put together for due diligence um, what potential hypothetical uses are. And then uh, we are going to have uh, a listen, at least one listening session and a public comment period um, following both this presentation and when the board meets with a lawyer to figure out, um, you know, what the what various options would look like from a legal mechanism standpoint, um, and then uh, you know we're going to take take public comment on this uh, both in written forum and also just have a forum when in Roxbury where people can get feedback on the features of the school. And just to make it very clear that as long as the school is in the district's hands, uh, we will be maintaining it and we will be ensuring that that building stays in in good shape and good condition and safe condition. And then just for one other process point, as you know, you just kind of walk through the steps we're going to take, but just so people understand that that's several weeks yes. and we aren't intending to make any kind of decision tonight no. or even in our next meeting or even in the meeting after yeah. that, even though this will be the on the agenda, it's more the chance to have the conversation with the public and learn what we need to learn. Exactly. Yeah. So to get that conversation started, uh, the board <laughs> asked me to present some hypothetical uses for Roxbury Village School that's for educational usage. Um, I wanna stress the word hypothetical. When I was thinking about each of these, these are really broad range. They do not have detail to them because that 
would take a lot of time for me to do. Um, so if there is more detail the board wants, then please direct me to do that. Um, but all of them right now are hypotheticals. So I, when I was thinking about these, each slide has benefits, needs, potential costs, and any maybe additional information to add. I thought about five different opportunities in discussing with my core leadership team, which are the central office administrators, any type of magnet type school, or really you could take magnet out in any type of schooling in general for a typical population of kids, uh, a regional BOCES for mental health supports, remote site for Central Vermont Career Center, the central office over there, or a larger community center with childcare built into the community center. So just a little refresher um, on where we are because of the budget pressures from uh, FY25, because of the change in legislation, the board decided to bus the elementary students from Roxbury to Union Elementary School. This equated to about a $1.5 million decrease to our local budget. Uh, the Roxbury building is currently hosting an after school enrichment program on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday that started this week. MRPS is maintaining the building and the costs are approximately 60,000 for building upkeep with the after school program going. So there's more custodial services, for instance, that are needed because of the after school programming. Um, the costs for the enrichment program is approximately $85,000 for the year if it lasts for the year. That was not a budgeted expense. So that will come out of, um, that will come out of another Rice point or another budget line. However, we are collecting a small amount of money from families for that service, but we won't be collecting $85,000 for it. Is that generally it for costs? Yes, for right now, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, just to clarify, is the 85,000 because we're running the after school program? The cost of the enrichment program is itself. approximately $85,000 that on top of the 60,000. Yes. Got it. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Thank you. And yeah. we were anticipating a possible grant for that, which we did not get. We right. did not get the grant. Right. But minus we still budgeted the, for the cost. $85,000 minus the tuition correct. or and or grants that may be part of. We don't have any grants payment. that are supporting it, but the but families are paying a small tuition for it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one option would be any type of magnet type school. Um, it could be sustainability, we talked about a STEAM school. The district in the past has talked about a bilingual school. That's, that's linked because there was a bilingual study done my first year as superintendent. Yeah, it came yeah. out in 2020. Yeah. Okay, so my, my third year of superintendent. <laughs> I think it started your first it's, year. Yeah, it was yeah. a long study. Yeah, it's a long study. Um, so the board at that time when they received that study um, did not decide to pursue, pursue the bilingual school um, option because of what the study said. We, we partnered with a well-known firm to help us with that. You could you could take any of those things out. Those are just three ideas. You could put a pre-K in there. You could you know you could take any of the the adjectives or describers um, and fill in the blank. I I just put some ideas that had been discussed in the past here. But any type any type of magnet type school, the potential benefits could be meeting community values and desires. Um, it could be innovative programming uh, or alternative programming options for our kids. Uh, the students would be in the building on a daily basis, which is something that the community of Roxbury really desires. So there are potential benefits that are quite large to, to opening a different type of school. The potential needs or drawbacks is that this would take significant planning. Um, it would reprioritize the focus of probably most of the central office administrators, definitely myself, Mike Berry, um, and probably Je Jess Murray. A bit so there we would have to reprioritize everything we're focusing on now to to do that significant planning because it may take a couple of years to do um we'd want to get a lot of community input about what the focus of this school could be uh we would have to hire an all new staff with expertise and whatever we would be looking for and we'd probably have to add some additional transportation because in order to make a magnet school type situation work, we'd have to have students from Montpelier also attending that school. So there'd have to be some cross buses happening. 
the potential cost is this would be a significant monetary investment. So just to give a ballpark figure, we state this in budget season all the time, that one teacher is approximately $100,000 if you think about salary and benefits that are offered to the teacher contractually. Um, so if you're staffing a school, that was where the primary cost savings came from um, moving the youngest students to Union Elementary School, you're talking about teachers, which are expensive. You're also talking about any type of renovation, furniture, or curricular resource needs. Uh, if we're doing something mag magnet type or innovative, then you're gonna need new stuff because we have traditional schooling things in there right now. If you're thinking about um, a larger pre-K center, for instance, you're talking about adding bathrooms for renovation. So we can only house two classrooms worth of pre-K students right now because we have one bathroom that fits the statute. So we would have to add two other bathrooms to the longer wing in order to have more classrooms there. And, you, and training, just training staff and professional learning around what whatever the focus might be. Um, this option would require MRPS to add the money plus some back into our local budget. So I think the cost just back in the math, napkin math with Christina and I would be well over $2 million to accomplish this option. We'd be adding back into our local budget. We could go after grants, but we would not be getting a grant for a while long term, as well as um, something that would cover this amount of money. Let me, yeah. Um, is there a possibility that um, if there was a magnet type school there, that it would um, attract more students? So you could get to the tuition, some tuition revenue. Yep. Yeah. So, like, you know, it, it's two million. But if it attracted, you know, um, some number of students, you don't know how many it would have to be, like a hundred or something, then that would be twenty thousand a kid, um, and that would be on par with what we're spending. I don't know, close, depending on all the fancy stuff. But um, so then it wouldn't really be like an addition to our budget. It would be that would be a large bet that Ford would be taking that we could attract that many kids. It would have to be really quite something. Right, exactly, yeah. I, I think that would be a, a, the board is welcome to make that decision and it would be a very risky one with taxpayer dollars. Were the, wasn't UES doing some like nature programming? We do, day? we work with the Eco Center. Or with, it's called Eco, with North Bridge uh, Nature Center. Yeah. Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, wasn't at, at Roxbury, I meant. Um, were they doing like some, some nature education like, they have Forest Fridays in place. They were actually, if the building were still there this year, they would be working with the with the North Branch Nature Center as well. Shannon had plans to to make that more um, structured with eco. Okay. Yeah, and I think here was where location also becomes a consideration because it, it is not in or near a high population area. So a lot of these hundred kids would have to come a fair ways to get that. Probably the vast majority of them. What what could we look to as magnet schools in Vermont that are successful, and or any sort of need studies that have been hmm. conducted for these things to understand what the sort of appetite for magnet schools are in the central Vermont area? The only magnet schools that I know of are in Burlington. Like what? The Sustainability Academy there. And so that's taking that is, is that part of the Burlington School District? Yes. And that pulls students from the surrounding Chittenden County town. No, it no. pulls kids from primarily the Burlington School District. It's an option for kids in Burlington. Do they have kids from other towns? Perhaps I don't know that answer. I can certainly ask Tom Flanagan, the superintendent there. But it is it is considered a a school of Burlington. Okay. The Burlington School District. Those so, are the only ones I know of. So when I think magnet, I'm thinking more kind of like what Jake was talking about, like pulling from a lot of neighboring districts or a specific type of education. Does that just not really, is that like not a thing in Vermont or? So this would be kind of a new, has there been any, to your knowledge, studies or like, you know, like needs assessments, like there's really an appetite for this kind of, Okay. Not that I know. All right. Thanks. 
Scott? I I think Lynn might have been in front of me, but really quickly, Lynn, um, I'm my my point I think is related to what Tim was just saying. I mean, in a sense, um, the the um, vocational education centers are magnet schools. They are drawing from a large geographic area. Granted, they're they're a specific type, um, but but that is an, a successful example, and at, at those, but it's certainly in central Vermont, not nearly as many uh, students who want to get in um, are accepted. And so um, there is an appetite, at least for some, for some types of like targeted uh, magnet type school. Um, and then really quickly, while I'm, while I'm unmuted, I think Libby, I heard you mention pre-K and I know we got an email um, about pre-K. And so pre-K would be a type of magnet school, I think I heard you say. Um, you and, can take magnet out and just put a school. Yeah. If you're talking about a school, you know, you could, if it's a school full of three and four year olds, it's, you would have yeah. the same pieces up here. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know enough about like, um, Head Start programs, but is there not federal funding that, um, can help with that type of programming? Um, yeah, so I, actually, I talked with Head Start about Roxbury Village School and they were interested for a hot second. Um, the location is a drawback. They don't believe they would get enough students to make it worthwhile. Uh, they cannot staff their programming right now. So for instance, we were a Head Start program here in Montpelier at Union um, and they could not staff the program. So we had to increase our pre-K capacity to staff their program. So they have staffing challenges. Um, so yes, they are federally funded and um, they are not interested. Is there, um, has there been any exploration of like, you know, the uh, larger universe of school types? Like just saying, you know, we would like to rent this out for a uh, an educational purpose. Is anyone you know interested in, in renting it from us? Don't you have that as an option mm -hmm. on here? It's one of the yeah. options yeah. for us to consider offering rental space. Okay. And does that? I mean, I think it was a question for Pietro. Does that fulfill the? I mean, it has to be an educational purpose for this district. Yeah. <clears throat> Lynn, do you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, is the two million the cost for the initial year, or is that the cost for running it in subsequent years? Nope, that would because... be everything. That would be that two million would. Remember, that's a wide ballpark figure. First of all, it should not be quoted. But if we cut one point five million with what was running in the school last year then 2 million would be a pretty good guess for getting a specialized system up and running. And it would continue based on healthcare costs rising and salaries rising and just cost of goods rising. I think that would probably be a pretty good ballpark to con that we would need, the board would need to consider going forward in the budget. Okay, And then the initial year would probably be more than that if you're doing renovations and stuff, right? Yep, it would depend on what renovations would be needed. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'm also hearing you say that it might take two or three years to even get the plan. In. We don't have this right now. So yeah, yeah. there's I mean, there significant on planning. Yeah. Would to yeah. Choose. Mm -hmm. Okay. So another option would be a regional BOCES. Act 168 is linked for members of the public or the board to to read last year. Uh, the legislature did pass a what they call a BOCES bill. It's a it's a structure that is in other states that tends to help with certain things. So I grew up in New York state, for instance, um, and had a teaching gig in New York state and for a little while and BOCES took very low incidence. They were separate schools that took very low incidence kids with special needs, with low incidence special needs. Um, so it was not an inclusive state. In other words, like kids were taken out of the public schools for those instances and attended BOCES. BOCES also did professional learning for teachers. Um, some BOCES run transportation hubs for school districts. Uh, what the 
my colleagues and I around the region have talked about is developing a regional BOCES for student mental health needs because this is a challenge for all of us. So some potential benefits, it would provide needed mental health services for students in the region. There would be a lot of collaboration across the region and it could alleviate some pressures on local schools to provide acute immediate mental health services for kids who really need it um, that we are all struggling with right now. So potential needs or drawbacks with that is that again, there's significant planning with our regional partners. Um, again, we'd need to hire new staff with significant expertise in mental health, and those particular um, unicorns are very hard to come by right now in the state. And we would be going for uh, a startup grant from the state in Act 168, I believe it's $10,000, which is not a whole lot of money. It doesn't go very far. That would probably cover the planning pro process. Potential costs would be a monetary investment that would be shared across the region. So again, one teacher equals about $100,000. Um, but again, that would not be borne by just MRPS. It would be borne by the region. Um, furniture, curricular resource needs, additional training for that staff, because again, we're talking about a highly specialized staff in mental health. Um, and if we were running the books on this, then we would need additional business office support because Christina could not take that on by herself. Our business office runs a $32 million budget and there are three of them in that room running that. So we would need to, if we were the um, people who did all the paychecks and all that kind of stuff, which we likely would be because it's an MRPS building, then um, we would need to hire additional business support to do that. So a regional BOCES isn't a standalone instrumentality. It's a, it's like an agreement amongst a bunch bunch of districts where one district is like the operating partner type of yeah. thing. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way, but it it in this case it would be because we have the building. So it wouldn't be like a new district. Like no. BOCES. No. It, so for instance, right now we have a regional collaborative with pre-K. So when the pre-K law changed to allow for people to use public dollars to go to private pre-K, yep. so I think my kid, my kid who's now a junior in high school, that was when he was he was starting pre-K. Right. He was one of the first people in our district to do it. Um, we have one employee who technically on paper is an employee of the Berry district, but all of us pay her paycheck and she runs all of our private pre K tuition. Her name is Becca. She's presented to the board once, maybe twice, uh, um, a while ago. Um, so she runs all the pre K for the region. She ensures all our private pre Ks are licensed, all the things that we would have to do if we did that on our own, but she does it for the region. So it it would is kind of, BOCES? it's not a BOCES it's because not it's BOCES. not a school. BOCES um, is, a, is a new thing, right? Yeah, this, is, this is a new yeah. idea, yes. Okay. And you said there's a $10,000 planning grant for anyone who wants to- There's a $10,000 grant. I don't think it has to be used for planning, but that would probably be what it would cover. But for folks who want to give it a whack, it's we can appeal to the state for yep. $10,000 to According do it. According to 168, yes. And then does this provide, you know, we were talking earlier about the potential merger discussion and whatnot. So some potential regionalization, even within the districts, is this- complementary to that um perhaps it seems like i mean there's a lot of questions i have about and i'm sure everyone does given that this is a new new creature but there seems to be if if there's a, a bigger regionalization push that to have some kind of regional uh asset for a an acute need um I don't know that, and there's money available to look at it with a bit more rigor. That might be an interesting thing to kind of push a little harder on, and and we're just investigating a little further. So the regional soups are doing that. Um, I would just state again: you need a dance partner, right? And oh, for sure, I, I understand that. There's a lot of yeah. If had, here. so I meet with regional superintendents once a month. Um, and we have had the conversation of using this building in this way. And there is a lot of pushback because it, because of the location. So the transportation costs from, so for instance, Harwood is part of our district. 
yeah. kids from Harwood would be traveling, kids with acute mental health needs would be traveling over an hour to get to a place that is nowhere near their hometown. On a regular, I guess I'm a little unclear about like on a regular basis or for or for like appointments or like, no, I guess they, I'm trying to. The, what we have talked about is a place when a kid is seriously in crisis and needs like a two week place to, to regulate. So in um, Plainfield, there's a school called Maple Hill yep. School. Is that a BOCES or is that some? No, that's a, a private school. That's a private school that kids go to. That we pay tuition to. Right. To send it because to. there's kids that mm -hmm. have those real struggles that need that extra, yeah. extra, extra support. This would not I mean, be that. Is this there, would be that for a short, short period of time. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. And is there a post school in Vermont? Yeah. No. Yeah. There's not. Libby, why did you not, I, I think, Tim, you have other questions. I'm sorry. I, no, I, go for it, please. Um, why did you not include a, in a draw, as a drawback that it's removing kids from their school? Is that not necessarily a drawback? I guess it's part of the, no, it is the a, purpose of this. Yeah, it is a drawback. However, it's happening already. I see. Okay. You know, it, it, but without the support, because, uh -huh. you know, like, if a kid is unsafe at school, for instance, then they're typically sent home, right? So this would not be that. Uh -huh. This would be sending them, what we have talked about, that what we've talked about is very broad and, you know, hypothetical and visionary and all that kind of stuff, no details whatsoever. Yeah. But what Massachusetts has a type of system like this that Lane Millington, who was the superintendent, Randolph and Ryan Herity, who's the superintendent. So both of them were principals oh, in Massachusetts. Okay. And they've talked about how that, this type of system, like a two week place for regulation. And right, I'm looking at you because you are much more expert in this than I am, um, was beneficial, is beneficial in Massachusetts and works well. So because we had expertise, you know, or knowledge of a certain system that worked mm -hmm. for that state, that's what we were focused on I see. as a regional superintendent group. It doesn't mean it has to be focus of conversation. However, the location, will be a is a constant maybe we can't do that because of the location is constantly brought to my attention mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i would say at this level of need the cost is exorbitant to yeah. do this well for instance the vermont psychiatric care hospital has a budget of approximately 24 million dollars for 24 beds and right wow is over budget because it takes a lot of people to be safe. Yeah, the uh, lever of expertise people, that you need. Uh, yeah, and uh, and people that are good yeah. at, at you know not having conflicts with people who need to who are in conflict. They're in a crisis, and their their body is seeking to express their discomfort. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've talked about that as well, and and the people as as Red knows too, just aren't there. Mm. You, so we could build it and we'd have kids and we wouldn't have adults there who could do what they need to do. So are BOCES by definition just for student mental health needs? So is this kind of similar to the magnet school idea in, in so far as there's a, a universe where if there's, and I don't know if there's a need for other types of services or other types of pedagogy that's specified to a certain cohort, but is that is that a possibility that a BOCES could might have another driving purpose? And and if so, I, I mean I guess it's it does seem that I guess the things I'm attracted to here are a push for regionalization, an opportunity to um, you know, do some planning with a grant and a building like there, I, I get that it might not all line up, but those things seem to kind of have some synergy that's attractive uh, that would bear a little bit of exploration. I don't know. The big needs that the regional superintendents talk about quite a bit are mental health. That's number one. Yeah. Right? That is number one, two, three, four, and five, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, and then the next one is for low incident special needs. So when I say low incidence, I mean um, 
low kids who who have low functioning um, autistic behaviors and are you know are unsafe with their bodies need somebody with them if not two people with them all the time and don't uh, communicate with communication boards or something of the like. Um, so very low incident special needs. Again, it, those are that would be like the top ten. <laughs> there really aren't other needs that school districts talk about doing something regionally. Um, we just haven't. That doesn't mean we couldn't. I don't think there'd be a lot of interest for something outside of yeah for the top, a sustainability top 10, school, said. for yeah. instance. Like why? Yeah, I don't think there'd be a lot of interest there. But I could I could ask. There's no harm in asking. I'm I'm curious just well you you know sort of why why I'm curious it seems like it's a new opportunity so it's you know and we have a building so that might benefit from a from an educational use so I don't know seems well just as an idea for just the process maybe because again obviously we're not making any we're not it tonight yeah. and. Perhaps, and we have another meeting. Our next meeting is um, also, this is the main item on the agenda. I wonder if, as Libby said earlier, you know, this is the broad overview of these ideas. If maybe there are specific questions, Tim, that that go along with your line of thinking that could help you as you continue to think about this, maybe like email those to Libby so she can bring them back sure. into the next meeting. Yeah. I don't know. I just think, like, you know, there's no need to force ourselves to try and say yay or nay to any of these ideas yeah. tonight. I don't know. No, this is this is just that's not where I was going with yeah. the comments. It was so more trying to kind of push around on these ideas to better yeah. understand them. And I think another better. another factor is um, accessing RVS from the west is slippery. Accessing RVS from the east is not possible. And it's a long way from, you know, so you're, you're, you're talking about your Northfield exit, your Randolph exit. And so it's, it, there is an access element yeah. to Roxbury Village School that it's why I live there because <laughs> um, I like to be left alone. But um, that makes it tough if you're talking about transporting kids over mountains, et cetera. Um, you know, those are factors when you're talking about like a, a two week place to go through crisis right. you know um because it's not like i they're mean does that there overnight you're not staying there yeah. overnight right and you're having a hard time well well being transported right. and you're on a dangerous road i don't know it's a tough those are those are also factors just just accessing the space is hard whenever i've brought up roxbury village school for a use such as this that is immediately what i am shot down immediately because of the location by regional superintendents. I think I think Glenn has her hand up. Oh yeah. Um I, I just wanted to double double check this. You said it would be short term use, right? Like not long stays. I said that is what the superintendents have looked into and discussed. There is no planning that has happened. There's nothing written on paper around this. Yeah, I've been out of that loop for a while, but I know, you know, there are a number of schools, some of them in, in very rural areas that have a specific focus, for example, um, you know, kids who've been involved in perpetrating sexual abuse or something like that. And um, I wonder, you know, if we have um, maybe some potential for a, a longer term program there for it doesn't have to be that issue. But, you know, there are and Barry for a long time had a of course, there's in a town, a city, but they had a program um, for kids um, who just couldn't make it in the regular school system. So they went daily for the year to a program in Barrie. So I don't know what, I don't know what the needs are now. And I understand the complication of traveling. Um, and I also don't know where there's potential there for like small residential or something. May I make an observation? Yeah. Sure. So, um, those aren't educational purposes 
not to like shoot it down because there sort of is, but they're sort of not. And the the one thing that I fear most <clears throat> is that Roxbury is unable to convince the select board to take ownership of the building, at which point an RFP becomes a possibility because what do you do with a building if the town doesn't want it or the select board doesn't want it? And I don't know whether the select board does. Um, and I, I know a lot of community members do. They want to make it into a thriving heart of the community. But that's my biggest fear is that the select board is of a different mind, that they don't want to spend other people's money on even basic maintenance or any kind of investment um, because they don't maybe, maybe just imagine there are a group of people that don't want to spend taxpayer money. That's a possibility. Which is frightening. And like... And I, and I apologize for not having the timing of these pieces well positioned in my head, but like I'm, I'm very interested in knowing what Roxbury ideally would like from the building, because um, that would would inform a lot of this. And like if we got the ball rolling on some project to create, you know, some special school, but it wasn't what what Roxbury wanted. Um, you know, that that would not be ideal. And, I think ideally what Roxbury wants is for their youngest learners to be filling Roxbury Village School again. Yes. Right. But I'm also saying that, like, what the majority of Roxbury, you know, right now, the select board determines whether they will take ownership. If, if, the, if the district is unable to find an educational purpose, it's on the select board. But the select board may not have the same wishes as a great number of people who, um, you know, don't want to run for select board. <laughs> so is it a situation that where um, we try to find an educational purpose and if we can't, we offer it to the town for a dollar? Basically, that's the general. That's basically, yeah. and, and we can ask Pietro <laughs> for some, I mean, you know, for instance, say we we're not sure we say we want to know a little more about how some of these regional conversations are going to play out um can we say we don't know and 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 hold on to it like there's yeah you just remit you just keep paying you the just keep paying it. the upkeep mm -hmm. of it which yeah. is definitely definitely a possibility yeah um you know i mean i'm a little in your camp jake of if I would kind of like to know what Roxbury is thinking because if we are holding on to it, you know, with the idea that there might be a you know kind of remote possibility that we might do something regionally, also knowing that like there's a good possibility that if something regionally does occur, that Doty's going to be open and it's a bigger, more accessible facility. Um, you know, are we keeping the town of Roxbury from? doing something on like a 2% chance that we do something with it. Mm. Um, you know, that that's kind of something I'd, I'd like to know, if, especially if we are going to hold on to it. Should we keep going? Yeah. So uh, before we do here, I have not talked to um, Jody at CBCC about this. So this is completely hypothetical. Just want to put that out there. We could rent the space to CBCC. Uh, potential benefits, CBCC has stated they need additional space. Um, it could be a potential revenue opportunity and rental income. It's an educational use. Our students are there. Yeah. Um, Potential needs or drawbacks, they'd be need to have significant renovation to accommodate technical education needs. It's suited for currently an elementary school, not a technical education school. We would, every district, every sending district would need additional transportation options and the location is a drawback, once again. The potential costs, it'd be a one-time monetary investment for renovation um, and the additional transportation costs for sending districts. As far as CVC is concerned, they'd have probably additional hires in some way. Um, CVCC has not expressed an interest in RBS, and it's located nearly an hour away from some, if not most, sending districts. So there's a there's a location difficulty there. But again, this is not something we've explored. Not explored at all. 
no <laughs> at all. And is it the same thing, Libby, where in the magnet school, you were saying you could take magnet out of it, you could take steam out of it, but we could say there are other other entities we could rent it to and have it study yeah. or is it, yeah, yeah yeah okay I was it's not our only I think I, I went to CVCC instead of saying rental space to an educational purpose because we have I mean they right they're part of our district it's easy to picture in, in essence it's yeah. easy to picture and it yeah. has an educational benefit for our district because we do have right. students who students there. from this district who yeah there. right so yeah. so say if we you know it would be tough to argue that renting it to say a private school might have an educational benefit for our district unless it service district kids. In fact, I don't know if we could rent it to a private school yeah. be, unless it was an additional building because the state has put a moratorium on adding any additional private schools. Okay. So a new school of a different entity, a private school could not come, that is not, does, is not in oh. existence currently, could not come and say, we're starting up a school and we'd like to rent your space because they can't in the state. But like, say, if a Waldorf school wanted to move that currently existed, that yes. could be a possibility. That but could it, be a but possibility. that's also we we don't know that right. at all the possibility. Right. Yeah, so it would be good to to you know see um, if any if anybody would be interested in that kind of thing, like a Waldorf school moving or like a Pacham moving. Um, I don't know what's out there, and I I feel like you know it, it, um, just kind of offering it out to see what what is possible um could be valuable and and that would take the pressure off us to control it so tightly you know and it would also remove the renovation cost and, and a lot of these if other it were an things. elementary school yeah i mean they're like it's i don't in in some scenarios it may not be on us to visualize what the what it can be like we're saying we want it to be an educational purpose but come to us with what you would do with the space. Okay. Uh, we could move the central office to RBS. Potential benefits would be to increase space. There are space needs here at MHS and particularly at MSMS. Um, all of central office employees would be in one space. We're currently spread out between uh, two different buildings right now. Um, there'd be more training space for staff development. If we were to do that, potential drawbacks, we'd need significant renovation to accommodate office needs. Central office staff would be far from every other school in the district and the majority of the community. And it would be a significant increase to commute time for most central office staff, which would make me worry about losing people. Potential costs, it'd be one-time monetary investment for renovation. There'd be additional mileage costs because we'd be driving back and forth to multiple, many people would be driving back and forth to Montpelier every day. Um, and a potential loss of staff, which when you're hiring new administrators and things, that can be expensive. Can you just before we go on to that yep. one, because it was raised in an email um, to us earlier tonight about how, like, why would this even be one of the options? I just wanted to say we had at the at about this time last year, you had brought to the board the idea of finding a different space for the central office team. Um, because we have such space needs at the high school and the middle school. And so that's why we thought, you know what, if we were even going to consider something in downtown Montpelier and we already have a building, let's at least have this be an option. Mm -hmm. So I just, that's, I and, um, make sure that was, that context is there, out there. Is there a way, you know, how do you, how do you dig into this to find out what this would mean to the central, I mean, is there a way to, to survey central office staff or, I mean, we had a, we, we, we had a, you know, we went into the summer and we were looking at spending $250,000 a year at, at an open office space for central office staff where Onion River Sports is. And now we still have the need, we still have central office folks who are in closets and all these other things that doesn't seem nice. I'm just, is there a way to, 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 I mean, that presentation came out. It was, mm -hmm. There was the possibility of mm -hmm. spending 250 Yeah, before dollars. budget season started. Right. <laughs> right. Or mm -hmm. anything else happened. Um, I have not brought, broached this with central office staff. I, I can say probably the biggest 
the two biggest factors in the negative column on this, or in the challenges column, let me say, is that it's you know 25 minutes away from the from where every child will be and every staff member will be um, outside of the central office. And I think of the swatting incident here at MHS, for instance, all the administrators at that point in time when that first happened were over at UES and Jason Gingold and I were here in two minutes after we were alerted to, you know, that that couldn't happen, right? In that kind of emergency situation, which thankfully doesn't happen a lot, but it does. Um, and, you know, human resources would be there. So our today, Max Jennings biked over to human resources on his break that that negates that possibility. So um, it's so, a good exercise. It it's is good, good exercise because we have lots of this great seat in the office. Um, but it's far away from, it would be far away from every staff member we have and every child we have. So, um, I mean, just a devil's advocate, you know, grown ups instead of children making the trip, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, most definitely. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's the, it's would be the board's prerogative. You're 100% correct. Um, I think that the second challenge is that half of our central office staff live um, not in this exact area. So for instance, that would just for myself, that would be an hour commute daily or an hour co commute one way, one way. daily. Um, and then you add in another commute back and forth to Montpelier to get to the school building. So there's, that's a lot of commuting time um, for a large percentage of our staff. And I'm not just talking about myself. I can just talk about myself because I know where I live. Um, but there are other people who live in Chittenden County or who live in Southern Vermont area. Um, do you think in the, I mean, looking at the calendar and seeing facilities, state of the states next week. And so like working this issue backwards from the space needs in the buildings, I'm honestly not super clear on what the needs were and are that drove the initial consideration. Is, is that going to be on the, is that part of the state of, state of the facilities report that was um, next, next? So meeting? Andrew gives a very um, in-depth book to the board around the facilities. <laughs> it's, yeah. wow. it's, okay. it's very wow. in-depth. So he doesn't go through all of it. I can find when those board meeting presentations were on yeah. space. Oh, right. I can share. Right, you got it? Yeah. Okay. So well, I think the best way is to go back in time and so see. Should we the link email? The whole board? Yeah. Just to That'd be great. Those. And do those, from whenever that was, do those persist? Are they, yes. are there greater needs now? Are there fewer? No, so it, pretty it much persists. Persist. Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, there's just not an office for every... Mm -hmm. There's just not an office for every part of the central office team. And there's just some challenges with like finding conference rooms and training spaces and things of that nature. Okay. So is the space more, I guess when I read that, I thought you were talking about like space for classrooms and student activities in is what's needed here, but you're saying it's more for like the professional office. No, it's in the end. I remember been watching those pre yeah. presentations. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. There's, there's some, there's some, if I recall, there's some, Classroom space that could be freed up yep. with the central office space. I mean, they're it's it's crunching both a little. Okay. Yeah, I'd watch. I'd watch if you're interested in that piece. Yeah. I'd, I'd watch the uh, the presentation that was made to the board last okay. year and read former facility reports. Uh, Lynn has her hand up. I don't mean to be calling on her, but I can just see it you on the screen. Um, that's what I was going to say. That I think in the facility report it suggested freeing up space in the high school by having the superintendent's office move out. Yep, but you will be enthralled by a very long report by Andrew in the next board packet. Okay, thanks. Um, we could create some sort of MRPS community center. Uh, potential benefits, we could offer daycare to employees. Um, we could increase flexible pathway opportunities for our Students here at MHS, we have a robust flexible pathways program here now. We can increase it with community garden, with child care opportunities, with senior care, et cetera. Um, we could continue the after school enrichment um, at Roxbury Village School. And this could have some potential revenue because it could, if you have educational uses in there with flexible pathways, perhaps you could rent the space 
to other entities as well or something. Uh, potential needs, the location again is a drawback. New employees with specific expertise, um, we'd have to increase our, our teaching staff with flexible pathways, particularly um, if we were offering things like childcare and senior care. Um, we That would need some significant collaboration with the town, I would think, about what the needs are because we would be pulling from um, the needs from the town immediately, you know, because of the location. And it would, it would um, have significant planning needs. Potential costs would be one-time monetary investment again for renovations. If we were thinking about something like a child care center, as I said before, with statutes and regulations, we have two classrooms that can work with three and four-year-olds. I do not know what the statutes are for um, more daycare possibilities. because That's not my realm. Um, but we have only two classrooms that are outfitted for um, three and four-year-olds because they need uh, closest to a bathroom. They need a specialized toilet. They need specialized size sinks. Um, and we have one of those. So two of our classrooms are close enough to one of those bathrooms. We'd have to add. Uh, it would have additional transportation costs because we'd have to get the kids back and forth if they were doing flexible pathways opportunities. We'd have to add new employees like daycare providers. We'd probably want some sort of building manager in place there. Um, if we were doing something this robust, we'd need to add business office staff because we'd essentially be running a business. Um, and we would need to hire teachers. It's unlikely that the revenue would equal or surpass the expenses. I just put that out there. And while I don't have exact figures, I can imagine that it would be unlikely. So it would be an add to the budget. Uh, looks like Scott has his hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so at first glance, it seems like this option is like the least risky least expensive I, I i totally understand that it's unlikely that revenue would equal or sur surpass expenses but but it 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 wouldn't it, it's the lowest bar for um success and with with little investment up front compared to the others and it it could offer a little bit more time in thinking about the best use of the of the building for our community um, as a school or for the Roxbury community as something else. Um, yeah, I mean, just, just the after school, I mean, essentially we're doing this right now with our after school enrichment program. Um, and, you know, relative to our overall budget, it's a, a, a small expense. Um, and so, so I would be most interested in, in what are the other options to, to go along with that after school enrichment that we're, that we're currently doing. And those were the hypothetical situations that I was thinking about. Any further questions or ideas people maybe didn't think in the mix? Scott? Yeah, so let me, I'm curious of, of all of the options that you presented, all the hypotheticals, what are the, what are, what is or are those that most excite you as a, as an educator and as a, as an administrator? I don't feel confident in any of them to answer that question. I think any of these scenarios would cause um, a significant veer in the direction of the district. So and what I say by that, I'm not saying that in a negative way. What I'm saying that in is that it that we would need to stop some of the work we're doing now at the at the district leadership level to fully commit to this work. Yeah, Lynn. Um, I just wondered um what the, I know the Roxbury Transition Committee was um, discussing some of this and there was going to be a meeting or there was a meeting with the selectmen about this. And I'm not clear, although I've looked at the minutes and stuff, um, exactly what happened with that and what what initiatives are coming from Roxbury about the use of the building. So to my knowledge, we have Tom Frazier here in the room who is working with Judy, forgive me, Tom, I forgot Judy's last name. Morris. 
what is it? Lusk. Lusk, thank you. Um, with a community group around ideas for Roxbury Village School. Um, we've met, Andrew and I have met with Tom and Judy once. Uh, the select board uh, led by Renee Bouchard, Bouchard um, has been in contact with Andrew, myself, Rhett, um, a bunch of times with lots of different questions. So the select board is looking at it and asking questions about this. I honestly have not looked at the select board minutes recently, not since summer. Um, so I'm not sure what their conversations exactly have been like. I don't know if Rhett, you can speak to that. They have a recent question too. So they're, it seems they like had a still, very recent yeah. question about PCBs um, and when the testing was going to happen. So that came in this week. Yeah. Um, so they are, it is, it is on the minds of the select board. Um, the rocks, I don't want to speak for the transition committee. So if I say something wrong, Rhett, then just interrupt me. Um, the Roxbury Transition Committee talked about this briefly and kind of came to the decision that they weren't the group, the best group to have this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, the the Transition Committee um, has a lot more. It's lost some of the Roxbury members, and um, you know, it, it's. It, I've been. There's there's been some distrust whether the transition committee is trying to determine what the outcome will be, whether it is. I mean, maybe potentially even in the future, as if the rocks, as if the transition committee or the or the school board is trying to decide what should happen with the building once the district is no longer in ownership of the building. I don't fully understand. There's. There's a lot of, there are a number of different camps. There's not a tremendous amount of cross, clear cross communication, um, but there's a lot of work being done to sort of, as I understand it, talk through a lot of possibilities, narrow possibilities, and have the, and for Tom and Judy and the, and the group that's working on understanding what the possibilities would be, they would like to have a short list for the select board that makes it an easier decision for the select board once this that that decision comes to the select board is that correct yeah that's that's basically that i mean our our biggest fear is that the select board will turn the voting down i don't think i think that that fear has pretty much gone away um i think they're interested in keeping the building and realize it's a huge asset to the community and our focus Heather's on the committee is um, pretty much along the lines of the last slide you had up there. Um, we want to keep it education focused, heavy to child care and pre preschool, maybe preschool program half a day, and then the second half a day, you know, is to transition to the room with transition to child care. They had a setup like that year, years ago when Dottie Wifrey was there. She ran the, the uh, pre K, pre K, and then at whatever time the child care first took over. Yeah. So it was all the same room, and it worked out, I guess, pretty well. So those are the kind of things that we're looking at. Um, they want to have a maybe a youth center, a senior room, et cetera. If there's a Bridgewater comparison where they took their school and, and it made it into a uh, I think they have three rooms of child care. Of course, there's a lot bigger community than what we have. But you got to remember, you keep saying Roxbury is a long way from everywhere, but it, it's not. It's dead center between Randolph, Barron, Montpelier, Valley, and Williamstown. Absolutely the same mileage each place. And Right now, Northfield kids are going over that Williamstown. I mean, you know, they're you know, so I don't think I don't think the distance is such an issue, especially with childcare. People make tremendous, uh, uh, you know, face tremendous challenges getting childcare, and they're willing to make those trips if it's good quality childcare, which is really hard to find. And I think you know, given the facility that we have. Um, you know, sliding into that slot could be much easier than somebody having a home that they're trying to retrofit 
to make into a child care facility. So I think, you know, our problem is money. You know, will the town support, you know, these transition costs that you keep talking about? I mean, I, I have a hard time thinking that they're even going to trans or support the uh, $60,000 a year to maintain the building, let alone. So we have to figure out some way to get some money. And, you know, if we could work together on that, that would be great. As a committee member, and just a tiny thing, um, you know, that makes a good point about like where we are in terms of communication of all these groups, and and so it's true that we haven't been communicating, but we um, or haven't like we're all kind of starting up, but um, over the summer. But I, I, um, people from each one of these committees have made an effort, especially in the last week, like since this agenda came out to figure out how to um, talk to each other more, more, more purposefully um, and to this, I include the Roxbury Select Board in there. So I just want you to know that there are, and I mean, Brett kind of said this earlier, but there are a lot of folks in Roxbury who are on one of a, a couple, a handful of different groups and are, and we're making an effort to figure out how to link all of our conversations because there's overlap. But then as Rhett said, there's also, you know, there are folks who are, you know, rightfully more concerned with how is their kids experience getting to and from school. And that's like kind of like one very big and important focus. And then there are folks, who, you know, like I don't I don't have little kids, so, you know, so we're trying to think about the building. So I think that there are a lot of really rich and generative conversations happening, and and we are excited to be able to talk to the school board and, and um, you get more information from the community over the next couple. And days. we do have a select board member on our committee, okay. so he's you know like the liaison. Yeah, he gets the front of all. But also, I would like to sit, take this opportunity to thank you for working out the transportation issue. Because you know that that was huge, and now people. I mean, my daughter who has two kids coming coming from her, she's very happy with the with okay. the setup. So okay. the extra work was definitely worth it. Thanks, Thanks for sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and just to be clear, I mean, we've got a timeline for this process, but we could very much come out of saying we need more time to to work with the town, to work with other entities, to you know, think about things. So. Um, we are we are in no rush to make quick decisions. The only our only timeline and the same as yours is the budget. Yeah. You know, that when when the select board puts a budget together, they've got to put depending on what you guys say, they have to have a budget item to maintain that facility after July of next year. Because that's when we figure everybody in town figures that's when we're gonna get it. Um, further questions or comments? And then, uh, you know, again, this is this is just introduction, and then we're having you know a series more conversations with both of ourselves and the community. And I think October second, there will there's likely to be something a forum yeah. more more intentionally warned like this that would have a second. Potentially, we would be able to warn a second public comment. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if we'll have a presentation. Yeah. Then there'll be a, a second public comment, and that would be at our yes, which mm -hmm. would and obviously Montpelier would be welcome, and we'll will then again reach out to Montpelier as well because yeah, Montpelier I mean, has an interest, I think, in you know passing budgets and yeah, you know, not causing harm. I think, yeah. and we want to encourage written comment on that too. So. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of timeline, we have for the next board meeting, the facility state of the state, and then we also have the executive session with the lawyer on the agenda, but this could also be, you know, a follow up again, like if there are specific questions about any one of these hypothetical scenarios that you could get to Libby and Jim and I to get back into the conversation, since this was a broad overview that would help keep the conversation going 
even outside of the more like legal advice we would get from the lawyer at the next um at the next board meeting just to just to say we don't have to only do the executive session about this at the next board meeting so yeah. that board members can you know keep asking questions and keep thinking about the different options all right excellent um Next item is policy monitoring reports, uh, which is A21, public participation at board meetings, A22, notice of non-discrimination, and FM100, which sounds like a radio station, budget <laughs> execution. Um, <laughs> do I have a motion to approve the policy monitoring reports? Uh, I move we approve the monitoring reports for those policies, A21, A22, and FM100. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any discussion or questions about those reports? Wonderfully enthusiastic. Very none. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, Aye. Aye. Reports pass. Uh, do you have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone.